and that itself tells a lot about the innovations that go on. And he will tell about one thing which is doing right now, which is in the forefront across the world, in an area which is very dear to all living beings, and that is water. We cannot live without water. So it is a pleasure to have him here. I welcome him. And I expect that you people will listen to him. And as creative and curious minds, you will ask him all kinds of questions. And sometimes, maybe they appear to you stupid, but I will say all stupid ideas also sometimes have great crazy ideas also come to great times. You know? So go ahead and ask a number of questions. Feel free to do so, interact with him. He's here for next two days as well. And take this privilege and opportunity to go ahead with more learning in terms of how projects are done. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your ideas with us. Uh, now I'd like to call upon Dr. Ajna Karakoti to introduce the speaker. Before I introduce the speaker, may I request everyone to please put your phones in silent mode or airplane mode, whichever is easier for you. Okay. Uh, Professor T. Pradeep, uh, Professor Kunju, faculty members, guest visitors from other institutes, and dear students. It is a great privilege and an absolute honor for me to introduce today's speaker to you. Many of us amongst the faculty already know him as one of the brightest shining stars in Indian research in both fundamental and translational research. I'm going to take time in introducing today's speaker to you as it is not so often that we cross our paths with such an accomplished speaker. So hold on. Professor T. Pradeep is an institute professor, institute chair professor, and a professor of chemistry at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, as we all know as IIT Madras. Having earned his PhD from Indian Institute of Science in 1991, he completed his postdoctoral training at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, University of California, Berkeley, and Purdue University, West Lafayette. He held visiting positions at many leading universities and institutes in Asia and Europe. He is also an adjunct faculty at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Professor Pradeep's research interests are in molecular and nanoscale materials, and he also develops instrumentation for studying these materials. He has authored over 360 scientific papers in journals and is an inventor of over 65 patents or patent applications. Some of his pioneering work has been in the development of affordable technologies for drinking water purification. He has been able to translate his research into affordable technologies, something that many of the aspiring faculty researchers like me try to accomplish. And some of these technologies have also been commercialized. For example, his pesticide removal technology has been incorporated in about one and a half million filters and the technology is estimated to have reached about seven and a half million people already. His arsenic removal technology from water, which has been approved for national implementation, has reached about 400,000 people and is expected to reach a million people soon. Along with his associates, he has also incubated two companies and one of them is already into production. He also recently secured a funding of 18 million dollars for commercialization of his technology from an international venture, a feat previously unknown to Indian academia. Befitting to his profile and hard work over these years, he has been a recipient of several national awards, including the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, BM Birla Science Award, National Award for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, Indian Nanotech Innovation Award and J.C. Bose National Fellowship. He is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. 
He has authored many textbooks on nanotechnology at both introductory and advanced levels. He is also on editorial boards of many journals from leading publishers such as ACS, RSC, Wiley, and Nature Publications. His other interests include education, popularization of science, and development of advanced teaching aids. He has authored a few popular science books in Malayalam and is the recipient of Kerala Sahitya Academy Award for the Knowledge Literature for the year 2010. In 2015, he received the Lifetime Achievement Research Award of IIT Madras for his contribution to the research in Indian science and technology. With this, I would now like to request Professor T. Pradeep to deliver the inaugural lecture of the research and seminar series of the Division of Biological and Life Sciences. Professor T. Pradeep. It's also it's always a great pleasure in, in, in to come and talk to you. Uh, this is my institution as well. This is uh, the institution of my dear friend Rishi Shankar. This is also the institution of so many budding researchers here, Ashutosh and Sanjay and all of them. It's also institution where uh, several of my MSc students did dissertations, your MSc students did uh, dissertations with me. This is a place that is rapidly changing. And I was I'm so glad to be here to, to speak on this first uh, lecture series. I wish to combine science with technology and translation. So I'll tell you a story of that translation with some research, some amount of business, and a large societal impact. So the objective of presenting this, it is, the objective of presenting this is uh, to inspire some of you to take up a career of incubation. And I am sort of happy to tell you that IIT Madras has now several of our younger students take up incubation as their career, not a foreign degree. And sometimes, because of this kind of activities today, Indian institutions are sort of uh, places wherein things happen and that happening can happen here in Ahmedabad University as well. So with that, let me tell you the story of uh, clean water uh, using materials. Can I have this somewhat, uh, a little more reduced light, lighting? Is it, is it possible? Okay. Aspect of life. Uh, it is not just life. It is in fact there is nothing that is not connected with water. So some years ago, it was around uh, 2002, I was doing my usual research. You know, the usual research for a chemist is to make some new material, investigate some properties, and write a paper about it. And I wrote many, many papers, and I continue to write papers. And I publish about 25 papers every year. Uh, it's not easy. It is every day you have to sweat it out. And my day starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and goes up to 12 o'clock. So this repeats every day and the only time I take off is Sunday afternoon. 
So the joy of doing innovation and incubation is actually the joy of work. So don't take it if you don't have the joy. Now this joy of publication was very much there. And in 2002, this question came up. Well, what can you do with this science? At that time, a very interesting or very important thing happened in the Indian science or Indian society that was we detected pesticides in Pepsi Cola. And that was the time that I decided that why not we think of some ways by which pesticides can be taken out of water. Why not use nanomaterials in this context? So that was the very early thing that in 2002 I looked at. And that science subsequently resulted in the very first patent application. As a scientist, I never applied for a patent. And that took me to my first patent. And then it went on to several patents and all that that Ajay talked about. So this science, the very early part of this science, I didn't really know that nanomaterials could have an impact. So when I first went to the funding agency asking for money, hey, can you guys give me some money to work on water and nanotechnology? They said, hello with it. Don't do anything about it. Nanotechnology will make big impacts. Where? In data storage, in electronics, in healthcare. It will very likely, very unlikely to have an impact on something mundane as water. So let us not really worry about it. But then I went on, and that study, uh, that story is a story that uh, you see today, glimpses of that. So this happened yeah, along with students. So they were interested in translating science uh, to society. And so therefore, this is also a story of lab to market. And that lab to market study, a story happened uh, principally with my former student, who is now an owner of the company. And there are several others as well, along with several governments and several other funding agencies, and we have now incubated one company, and another company has also been incubated. So we are talking about water. To take this discussion uh, to context, this is probably the largest problem on the planet. So this is our planet, 12,600 kilometers in diameter. And if you take all the water, is this required? Is this needed? So if you take that diameter large planet, this is all the water on the planet. In comparison to this 12,600 kilometers, this is this sort of, this is a sphere of about less than, slightly over 1,000 kilometers in diameter. So that sphere encompasses all the water in the oceans, all the water in the air, all the water in the plants, all the water as hydrates, all the water as heights, all the water that we have. And this is the water that we have as clean water. This is just about 3% of that. And this is the water in the glaciers. This is the water in the rivers. This is the water in lakes. All that water is here. But this water is really not usable. The amount of water that is usable is not really shown here. It is a sphere of 56 kilometers in diameter, a very tiny sphere. So that is all the water that is usable. And if you start looking at that water, the amount of clean water is shrinking with time. In fact, that you can make a thermodynamic a statement like in, you know, the entropy increases 
in the universe, as you say. You could say that the extent of clean water decreases with time. In fact, it decreases with development. You ask this question, what is, well, this, this is the water. You know, this, this water you can't really make. At atmospheric temperature and pressure, you can't make clean water. The water that is there in the planet is finite. And it is so finite that you can actually measure the number of molecules of water on the planet. You can convert from water, from sugar to water. You can, you can do combustion reactions. You can convert methane into water and CO2. But actually, you know, this is a cycle that you have. At atmospheric pressure and temperatures, the amount of water is constant. Now this water, a bit of this water, uh, is clean water which we drink. And we drink this water because of clean water. We drink clean water because of chemistry. Why is that we are saying that? Well, if you take the river that is sort of flowing on this earth, it doesn't contaminate the water because all the minerals exposed on the surface of earth, they all have solubility constants very small. Very small solubility constant, alumina that is present on the surface. Solubility constant is of the order of 10 to the power minus 30. You have silica that is present, you have iron oxide that is present, you have all the minerals that is present on the surface, the earth presents materials which have very low solubility in water. In contrast, all the chemicals, all the materials that we have created, they all have very large solubility in water. So, a number of materials that we have created, you know, the very first compound that we created by Oler created urea in 1828. Since then, we have produced 8 million compounds. 8 million organic compounds and 1 million inorganic compounds. 9 million compounds we produced and all of them have very large solubility. The only way by which we can run industry is by throwing or extracting waste by water. The only way by which you can run big civilizations is by extracting or washing their waste with water. Think about it. You cannot create an Abu Dhabi or Bombay without flushing your waste by water. And that is why our civilization contaminates water. That is how our development contaminates water. Is there a way out, you might ask? Chemistry, which has contaminated water with its nine million compounds, can you ask new chemistry which will not contaminate water? Well, that is another chemistry which I would call poetry. We'll come to that as we move along. So this surface this is a very important concept that you may want to keep in your mind that surface exposes so many, you know, earth, earth surface exposes only those compounds which preserve or which allow clean water on the planet. Why are we talking about nanotech uh, in this large context? Well, nanotech is very, well, the science of 10 to the power minus nine. Science of materials of that kind of dimension in meters, 10 to the power minus nine. Very tiny, very part science of very tiny particles. The science is very big, very big. But actually, we are interested in the very tiny aspect of the science. This is like saying that you have this great thing called quantum. How big is this quantum? Quantum is very tiny. Quantum is nothing. Quantum is nothing. But quantum has changed the planet, right? So without quantum mechanics, uh, you don't run your mobile phone. You don't run your semiconductors. You don't run your transistors. I don't run my laser. 
we don't speak, we, nothing is possible without one. When we can get this into a more detailed discussion, you can engage with your teachers as to how quantum mechanics enables your life. Uh, but it is, we are interested in the smallness of these nanoscale materials, which we create this. These are called nanoparticles. And we can today, the good thing is that we can make all these materials with so much of precision in the laboratory in such a short time. This is gold. And I make something called gold nanorods. You know, very interesting aspect here is that when I was a kid, went to the laboratory to make one compound. One compound, you have to struggle from morning to evening and make one compound. What is a compound? Compound is something new with new properties, right? Something with a new color, something with a new smell, something with new fluorescence, some property. Here, mix many things, finally to get a compound, those of you who have done practicals will know that you have to spend tedious hours to get one little compound. Today, and this compound required A plus B plus C plus D, nitrogen plus carbon plus hydrogen plus something. You have to put so many things, only then you get a compound. Here today, I can get this gold, this gold, and come to the laboratory and make a new material out of gold in just about 30 minutes. And I do this business slightly differently, I get another compound. I get a nanoparticle, I get a nano rod, I get a nanosphere, I get a nanostar, I get many things, and all of them are different, having different properties. One element manifests in different forms. Here, God comes in different avatars. And you get this extremely fast. New kinds of synthesis, new kinds of protocols. We create a huge variety. And all of these have different, different properties. They all are the same element. So we create nanomaterials of different kind. Why are we talking about these nanomaterials of different kind? Well, look at this. Here is a particle. This is very similar to a piece of quartz that you can get from the, the road. So this is a silica particle. It's very similar to that. Now, this is actually a, a piece of gold. Now, what is this piece of gold? Well, this is a nanomaterial. If I take a corner of these, expand this thing, you see, I get this particle. See, this one, if I expand, that's what this is. Here is that, that corner I am expanding, and it is composed of particles. I have assembled several particles. Each one of these particles, if I expand, that is composed of atoms. So I create materials of this kind. Today we have ways of creating all these different materials. Why are we interested in these? Although this is made of gold, this is like ceramic. If I drop it, it will shatter. It looks, it is black in color. Well, it has completely different properties than the gold that you are aware of. Such nanoscale materials can be very useful in water. Why are we interested in it? Because of three properties, essentially three important things. One is something called more for less. So if you take a piece of gold and cut it into several pieces, smaller and smaller pieces, the number of atoms on the surface in these small, several pieces, if you collect all of them together, one gram of this thing, cut it into several pieces, you will get more number of atoms on the surface. So these atoms on the surface, you can utilize for properties. Although you use just the same one gram of material, you use more atoms on the surface, so essentially you can get more properties for less amount of materials. So this is something very interesting. How large a property can you get? One square cent a cube centimeter cube is having one centimeter square area here, 
one centimeter here, one centimeter here, one centimeter here, one centimeter here. Six centimeter square area is what you can have from one centimeter cube material. But you can get something like a football field of surface area by cutting these into nanometer scale particles. And on that football field, if you can assemble molecules like these pesticides, you can collect a lot of pesticides on the surface. That can be very interesting when it comes to interesting adsorption of properties such as adsorption. What are the other properties? We can get many other things. Imagine this particle. Now each particle I can functionalize it meaning chemically bonded with different molecules, I can get many properties. We call this chemistry of these ligands. We have properties of this guy. This property of this particle is very different from the property of this. For example, a piece of gold at this dimension can be luminous. You shine some ultraviolet light, what comes out is red, luminescence. And there are many other properties of this kind. The other interesting aspect, why we are interested in nanomaterials, is because we can tackle extremely low levels of contaminants with nanomaterials. So imagine, imagine you know, the number of contaminants or the amount of contaminants that you can tolerate in drinking water. If you look at the permissible contamination in drinking water, this has been decreasing with time as we went on understanding the impact of contaminants in drinking water. Can you tell me an example? Well, for many cases, it reaches limits of detection. Here is a case of a glass of water. This glass of water, one glass of water contains 200 ml of water. 200 ml of water is something like 180 ml of water you take. 180 ml of water is 10 moles of water. 10 moles of water is 6 in the 10 to the power 23 into 10. So that is 10 to the power 24, 6 in the 10 to the power 24, or 10 to the power 25 moles. <coughs> this is what you have in one glass of water. The number of molecules of many contaminants that you can tolerate in that water is 10 to the power 12 molecules, which means one molecule out of 10 to the power 13 molecules is a contaminant. That is what you can tolerate. Imagine removing one contaminant from 10 to the power 13 contaminant, 13 water molecules. This is like removing one, one terrorist from 10,000 Indias. One India is 10 to the power 9 species or nine people, one billion people. 10,000 India is 10 to the power 13 people. One contaminant from 10 to the power 13 is what you want to remove. And you want to remove this, not removing, you know, not, not like removing one terrorist from 10,000 Indias. You want to remove this in one minute. Meaning you want to get a glass of water in one minute when you stand in front of a purifier and you want to remove one contaminant from that. Imagine you have, you are at the airport entrance. 10,000 people are getting, 10,000 Indian population is getting into the airport. You want to pull out or pick out one Dawood Ibrahim from that. So this is an extremely difficult task and this is an extremely difficult proposition for chemistry to selectively identify and remove that contaminant. Only that type of contaminant, nothing else. You have to be selective, you have to be sensitive, you have to be extremely efficient, you have to do it at high kinetics. And that is a very important job, and that can only be achieved with nanomaterials. Now you ask this question, can you go to that kind of limits by materials? Well, before doing that, let me tell you what is the kind of contaminants that are permitted in most cases. Here is arsenic in drinking water. 
This is the amount of arsenic in drinking water in 1959. This is 200 parts per billion. As we understood more and more about arsenic, we went to 50 parts per billion. This is the international norm. And we went to 10 parts per billion. And many people think, many nations think that we have to go down to two parts per billion to, be, to, to have safe water. So this is how contaminants limit is getting regulated and regulated. Can we reach there? This view graph is telling you that with a nanomaterial, I can actually change the color of this particle to this particle with just nine ions of mercury. So you could go to extremely low levels, nine ions, meaning 10 ions, you are talking about zeptomolar sensitivities of water or detection. So you have heard of nanomolar, picomolar, femtomolar, atomolar, and all that. So here you can go to zeptomolar sensitivities with materials. With that kind of sensitivity, which actually means that you can remove it. So you could go to extremely low levels with such materials. This is not about that kind of materials alone. You can think of cavities like these. You have biological channels. You have imprinted structures. People are working in Neri, for example. Assemblies and fibers, many such things can be done. And all of these can be made very selective. So I'll show you one or two examples. So here is a category of materials called metal clusters. So these are materials, you might have heard that in nanomaterials, when it comes to nanoscale, properties change with size. So if I take a melting point, property changes with size. And that change is continuous. But you get to a size regime where properties change discontinuously with size. So imagine, for example, there's a 25 atom gold that you can make and you make it a 24 atom or 23 atom, the properties change discontinuously. Such a regime of matter is called clusters, and we make such clusters in the laboratory. That much only is the time that I have to tell you about it. What is the new thing? So here is a 15 atom gold, which is luminous. Nobody would have told you that gold will luminous. Today you have materials which can be made in quantities. In synthesis, you can make grams of these kind of materials. You have structures. You see, this is a nanoparticle of gold. So these are all atoms of gold with specific locations. These are gold, and these are protected with some ligands. So today, you have got synthetic chemistry or nanomaterial science has advanced to a level wherein you can have materials with atomic precision precisely these many number of atoms. You can make that in the laboratory. With several such materials, we made something in this paper which talked about a biopolymer reinforced synthetic granular composites for affordable purification of water. Some complex, some words are there. What does it mean? Whatever nanomaterial that you may have, you want to pass water through. If you want to pass water through, you, you want that material to be granular. The water that passes through should not cause a pressure drop, and water will flow without res resistance. So it has to be granular. And that granular material we made using a kind of chemistry. And this chemistry is something very interesting uh, for you to use such materials. You know, quite unlike any other material, water, materials used in water should be made in quantities. What kind of quantities? Ideally, you should be in a position to make millions of tons of this material because you use millions of tons of or millions of liters of water. So otherwise, this technology has no relevance. In the process of utilizing these materials, you, can, you clean up water, right? This is what the whole purpose is. 
But in the process of producing these materials, you could contaminate water. In the process of disposal of these materials, you could contaminate water. So what is the amount of water that actually you have made? The clean water that you have made minus the amount of water that you have used for your production minus the amount of water that you have used for its destruction. You add all of these together, if the water cycle is net negative, no point in having this material. So we wanted to have an ideally green material which will produce positive water, net positive water. And that, we said, we could make with the biomimetic process. So what is that? We created a porous material in which nanoparticles are embedded. Water could go through this material, water will interact with these materials, but nanoparticle will never get out of this material. How is it possible? The pore sizes are such that water can get in, but nanoparticles cannot get out. So what does that mean? That also allows you, some, gives you something very interesting advantage. Water contains many particles. None of these particles can get into this cage because the cage size is very small. So you can keep your nanoparticles preserved in the condition and their surface activity will be preserved. And that way, no nanoparticle will choke. And that way, no nanoparticle will get out, meaning that there is no nanotoxicity, which Rishi and Kalo and our company work on. So several people uh, covered uh, the subject. Look at this. 21 species regulated in drinking water are halogenated organics. 15 species regulated are metals. Nine, 13 species regulated are organochlorine pesticides. If you add all of them, there are there are 92 species regulated in water. Almost all of them can be controlled using nanomaterials. So how about creating clean water using a number of nanomaterials which would do selective chemistry to get rid of these contaminants. It will not touch other wanted species or good species in water. We live not only because of water, we live also because of many minerals. We don't want to touch them. So we developed one such thing that was this pesticide thing that I told you uh, long ago. So what is this paper about? This paper said that it is water positive, I just told you. It is water-based synthesis. It is done at room temperature. It is also water-stable material. See, a material which is made from water, dissolved in water at one point in time, but it is producing water-stable materials at room temperature. This is almost like creating seashells at room temperature. Chemistry has so far not made seashells. So this is like creating, doing biomimetic synthesis of this kind. And therefore it is green. We don't use electricity for its production. So here is how we make. So we have biopolymers, many. Hydrocyan is one biopolymer. Cellulose is another biopolymer, and we have banana silk and many such biopolymers. And we deposit nanoscale iron oxy hydroxide or aluminium oxy hydroxide on this. And these pieces are about 50 nanometers in length, 15 nanometers in width, and about 15 nanometers in breadth. And this would be like this would be like sheets. And these sheets can come together like that. And of course, it is not like this alone. You have sheets like that. You have sheets like that. So you can create matchboxes. And these matchboxes are reinforced with biopolymers. Originally, they were soluble in water with gradual precipitation and nanoscale uh, sort of growth. You can create materials like these, which are like sand. And if you pour water on it, it is stable. Can you see these uh, sheets? Yes, you can she see these sheets. And in these sheets or in these boxes, you can put nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles then can be silver nanoparticles. The silver nanoparticle will release silver ions. It will destroy bacteria. 
Only silver ions, it will never release silver particles. It can, you can put iron oxyhydroxide, and you can put arsenic and get scavenged in that. And you can put something else, you can remove fluoride. So you can create a kind of a box. There are many, many different materials you can create in this kind of a box. And there can be many different polymers and you can create many different oxides. So there is a lot of variety that is possible in here. The silver nanoparticles, somebody must have told you, is very good for antimicrobial activity and all that, but the silver doesn't work normally. Why is that it doesn't work? When silver nanoparticles are put in real water, a tiny layer of calcium silicate deposits on that silver. How thick a calcium silicate? About 50 nanometers thick calcium silicate deposits over a period of one week. And what happens? Silver ions don't get released. And as a result, this purifier or this silver's antimicrobial activity doesn't work. And that is not the case here. Here is silver ions are getting released at this concentration. In the laboratory, we run quite experiments quite different from a normal laboratory. Normal laboratory, we run experiments on one liter. So here we run for 1500 liters. And we, these days we run experiments for 4,000 liters. And this is like drug release. You see, this releases silver ions like a drug. And that is the amount of silver ion that you can tolerate in drinking water. That's a limit that you should have. So it is below the limit. And you can destroy bacteria. You can do live dead staining. I don't have to tell you. You might have been already introduced to this. These are red, dead bacteria at the end of the silk. 50 ppb of silver that you have. Now, water doesn't contain just this uh, um, bacteria and some ions. It can have high TDS, total dissolved solids. Under that condition, does it work? Yes, it works. That is the input load of bacteria. At this kind of TDS, it works, meaning there is no bacteria alive. At pH, this is the drinking water pH. Does it work under that pH condition? Yes, it does. What about total organic carbon? It works under that condition. So it works in the field conditions. That is quite important. Does it release nanoparticles? Well, you can do spectroscopy. So this spectroscopy is called single particle spectroscopy. You can take a nanoparticle and collect a spectrum from that. One particle, by the way. This is another particle, you can collect another spectrum, which is green spectrum. So if you selectively give particles into bacteria like E. coli, they will gobble up all these particles, and you can collect spectrum like this. Now you ask this question, give the same E. coli, expose it to our material. It doesn't see particles because no particle comes out. However, ions come out and E. coli, you can kill that. You can see sort of called lysis. You don't see any bacteria any particle inside. So there is no nanoscale toxicity due to nanoparticles uh, in this process. You not only do one particle, you can collect, you can collect, do this spectroscopy on a collection of particles. This is not the only thing. This material is made of aluminum. So is there aluminum coming into water? No aluminum comes into water. That is the limit of aluminum. What about uh, uh, if you do total organic carbon? You get carbon into water, no carbon. So with all that, you can do prototypes. So we can construct a prototype. Water can be poured in, and silver ions will be released, and it will interact with bacteria. And when it comes out, there are another kind of material which will remove arsenic or lead or whatever else from drinking water. You will get clean water. So you contaminate water deliberately with so many ingredients and create what is called a synthetic tap water. And then you study what happens. Bacterium input, this is the output. Iron input, output. Lead input, output. Arsenic input, output. You can study this over several hundreds of liters of water. So you have now, you study for one selective contaminant. So here is arsenic. So that is arsenic and iron contaminated water. Iron is colored, arsenic is colorless. So we have put some iron also 
to make it appear like uh, bad water. So here is clean water. How much of material is this? This is 20 grams of material, and that is the input arsenic concentration, 200 parts per billion, and this is what you get. So you see, for six months, for a small family, you can run this with just 20 grams of this material, giving you arsenic-free water. Is it possible to do this for a home? Yes, we can do. That is the input arsenic, and that is the output arsenic. This is the input iron, this is 4,000 ppb, or 4 ppm, and that is the output of, uh, of iron output. And not just this few hundred liters, you run it up to 6,000 liters, meaning you run it for one family for one full year, and you can deliver arsenic-free water. The new thing that has come from our science is that it's not just silver ions that you contaminate, or that can be antibacterial. If you add a little bit of carbonate, it is possible that silver uptake in the viruses, this is a virus, uh, MSPH, the silver uptake gives you stains. The stain is higher because of carbonate, because carbonate allows more silver ions to get into viruses. So as a result, the amount of silver ions used for antimicrobial activity can be reduced by half what does it result in? Silver saving. It results in about 1,250 pounds uh, of silver saving for the world. So, this kind of things you can do. So we implemented a purifier in arsenic affected areas. Amrit, it is called arsenic and metal removal by Indian technology. That is what is Amrit is. And we have put this in this particular state called West Bengal. And there is a district here called Murshidabad, about uh, 80 kilometers from Kolkata. And there are 100 locations in the Murshidabad district that is shown here, and we implemented this. So here is a typical traditional purifier or plant, which is occupying about one acre of land. And now this whole, because of this material has a large capacity, you can reduce this purifier size to just about seven cents of land. And in Calcutta or in West Bengal, where the population density is something like 800 per square kilometer, this means quite a big saving. In addition to many other savings. So what happens? So we put this in many affected areas, the input arsenic concentration you can read, that is the output. So if you look at one such place, 287 is the highest concentration we see, and that is the concentration at the output after 240 days. Some others at different times we monitored this. We went on monitoring it. Now it is three years we have been monitoring this. So what has happened? We created a product, and that result, you know, that came from from this particular pilot study uh, that we conducted. So we did this in other places as well. That is a kind of concentration that you see highest, but many places are small, and that is what you see at several, after uh, several weeks and years. So now, something very interesting has come. This particular one is one product. So we thought, this material has a very high capacity to remove arsenic and very fast removal, as I mentioned to you, fast kinetics. So is it possible to connect with the borewell pump? So here are, there are 2.45 million borewell pumps in India. And of which 15% of the borewells deliver contaminated water. So we took 330 borewells in one district, which is another district affected by arsenic called Nadia. There we implemented this, that is the input, this input is directly connected here, and there you get the output. And 330 of these locations were locations where, where, where there are schools. So we collected that. And today, we are in the process of creating sensors. So if you can create sensors for measuring arsenic using similar technologies, maybe electrochemistry, by some biosensors, you might be in a position to create new arsenic sensors. And ultimately, you will be able to connect it to the mobile phones. So this is in the field, and it is possible to link up this. 
it is possible to do online data collection. You might be able to collect from 2.4 million pounds every day one data point, meaning 2.4 data points per day. And that would be a very large exercise uh, for the country. So is it possible to develop such sensors? So here is a colorimetric sensor. This is a cluster which actually changes color uh, when it comes to in contact with metals. Here is an example. These are fibers. Using these fibers, we can create a membrane. And this membrane, visible light is like this, and ultraviolet light is like this, because there are fibers like that. These fibers are very sensitive to metal ions. How sensitive? So here is what happens when it is in contact with mercury. In real time, it changes color. How sensitive? With 80 ions, 80 ions of mercury, you saw this kind of drastic color change in real time. Is it possible to develop other sensors? There are many other sensors that we have, we have developed. So as a result, this has become an attraction, and several people have uh, talked about it. We have several other technologies as well. So, not just our technologies, many others have technologies. This we call now Aqua Nanotechnology. This is an 800 page book. So, tiny particles offer a number of solutions. What more to do, and what did they not tell you? Affordable sensors, I touched upon this, but many, many things you can develop here, and all of them can be a company. And why are you making that company? Because it is not just the same arsenic in water, or fluoride in water, or mercury in water, or chromium in water, or something. It is also, your, your food is getting contaminated. Your vegetables are getting contaminated. Your health is undergoing drastic change. Your environment is changing. How about you walk with a smart dress, which will tell us about sensors or problems in the air. These are very interesting. Unknown and poorly understood health effects. We work on this. Impact of existing technologies on our water resource will require new technologies. Effect of agrochemicals and environment and health, there are in fact not just isolated impact of agrochemicals, but there are collective impacts. Today we know that arsenic can trigger something else in presence of certain pesticides. And combining smart sensors and smart purifiers, today's purifiers don't have that. Can you combine this? Sustainable chemistry for clean water so that that chemistry will be tomorrow's chemistry which will not contaminate water. Biological methods of clean water, there are biological channels like aquaponics which people are incorporating into membranes so that you have extremely efficient water purifiers. Think about this. You stand in front of a coconut tree and this coconut tree is converting dirty water to clean water in under 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, it is doing this. Is it possible to develop a new coconut and drop it into salt water to collect clean water? Is it possible to think of new water harvesting machinery resembling chemistry of nature? So maybe when you turn 50, there may be somebody coming up on the stage and telling you about that chemistry 30 years from now and offering you a coconut. Here comes that. So maybe something very new might happen. And that would be molecular nanotechnology. And that, how do you do that kind of science? Well, I just told you something that we are doing. How do you do that science? Well, obviously, there's a whole lot of lessons. Right? Only when you live with me, I can impart a part of that lesson to you. But otherwise, take some few lessons. They start small, right? My group was also just one person. Like, uh, you know, here, if he said it has become 60 people. 
By the way, it is not 60, 60 MSc students. These are 35 PhD students. So these are the very large research groups. Uh, start small. Of course, you have to think big. And when you think big, you think about the nation. You, know, you think about large objectives. And when you start doing this, it is impossible if the institution is not behind you. So we are fortunate to have, to be part of an institution where institution is backing you. So I keep telling my people that you can't push me back because there is this great institution standing behind me. You will never push me back. You cannot. And I also tell my students that my foot is so strong that you cannot bend me. It is impossible because your foot is strong. So build institution. Stand part of this institution. Of course, it is possible only with a team. And team is your own team. And resources meaning institutional, financial, material, intellectual resources. As my father used to say, he would say, that fellow, never start something. Never start something. When you start it, stay with it. Never leave it. So he would say, you know, this is this Emily tree. He would say, if you want to hold it, tree, hold that tree. And don't hold any other tree. So this is possible because of my institution. It's a beautiful institution that I come from. Uh, and uh, institution has a lot of things other than human beings. And I should tell you what that story has been with a short movie here. It's about six minutes of uh, movie. Water, a transparent fluid which makes the words, streams, lakes, oceans, and rain. The answer of life. No known life form exists without it. 71% of Mother Earth. However, for many of our fellow citizens, safe water is a dream. In the districts of Nadia and Murshidabad in West Bengal, India, the water resources are contaminated naturally with deadly arsenic, a known metal with atomic number 33. Long-term exposure to arsenic poisoning can cause skin cancer, ailments of lungs, bladder and kidney, and eventual death. The Pradeep Research Group at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, funded by the Department of Science and Technology, has been working on drinking water solutions for over a decade. We were looking for solutions which would uh, serve the purpose of say 50 to 200 families. And then I came to know about IIT Madras, Professor Pradeep Group led uh, community filter and it is a nano technology based filter which uh, has flow rate of 50 to 70 liters per hour. That was ideal for placing in places where it could be used as a standalone unit. It could serve uh, more than uh, 100 uh, families. I identified the locations. And it has been running successfully. We had tests done in the on the pipe water, on the, on the output water, and found that uh, actually the arsenic contamination was nil. So I think this was a very ideal solution in such situations where you have remote areas where you have hardly any power supply. After the success of a pilot project in the district of Murshidabad, implemented by Messiers. Mahavir Pumps Private Limited, based at Kolkata. 600 such water purifiers are being installed by the government of West Bengal 
funded by the Ministry of Minority Affairs. The purifiers are being installed in schools and communities. An IIT Madras incubated company, Inno Nano Research Private Limited, manufactures these water purifiers at their factory in Chennai. The purifier has evolved into another visually attractive model, the design of which was born out of specific necessities in community water purifier stations. By the district magistrate of Nadia, last year we have installed around 330 units of nanotechnology based arsenic filtration units. I have found it to be very effective, cost effective, and more importantly, a speedy technology for tackling one of the uh, dangerous menaces of our country. The technology has also been implemented in high volume discharge applications and has found acceptance among the local populace. Approximately around 50 lakhs of population is, uh, is affected by arsenic uh, contamination in the water. We in the district administration also took some initiative uh, in introducing anti-arsenic uh, water purifiers. This technology is based on land technology and so far more than 500 community locations this, uh, this technology is being used and the feedback from the uh, people is really very good and encouraging. This particular technology removes uh, not only arsenic but also iron. The benefits have started showing. Lesser and lesser number of people are reporting sick due to water related causes. <laughs> With a mere flushing and cleaning of filters needed at periodic intervals, these water purifiers are extremely simple to maintain. And the cost of filtered water is less than 5 paise per litre, approximately 0 0.07 US dollars. The technology is now delivering clean water to 400,000 people. There are a large number of water quality issues waiting to be solved. Pesticides, heavy metals, fluoride, microbes and many more. India and the world outside are waiting. Let's ensure that affordable clean water is not a distant dream. This doesn't just contribute to the improvement in the quality of the drinking water, but also to the quality of the life of the people. With increased support from government at various levels, we will be able to expand it to other parts of our country with arsenic and iron contamination. These children will now continue to smile. They will no longer be under the threat of deadly diseases due to poor water quality. also a story of several students, um, a lot of people, especially this group of people, they are now the owners of a, of a company and, uh, and a great institution uh, which has now set up a new center on clean water. 
I should thank you for this opportunity. Let me, I look forward to questions if you have some. Thank you very much. such a thought-provoking uh, lecture. Uh, it was certainly uh, very encouraging for all the students present in the audience. Uh, now we would like to uh, invite uh, questions from the audience. 